Tyler, I know, I know you were chomping at the, at the bit to put the picture that you found for this message on that screen. You can do it. <laughs> Build the wall. <laughs> ah, oh, Lord. <laughs> Ezekiel 22.30. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. But now I want us to say, I'll be the one. I'll be the one. Lord, I'll stand in the gap. I'll stand in the gap. I'll go before you on behalf of the people. Will you stand in the gap? Will you? Y'all with me? Will you stand in the gap? Will you stand in the gap between the Lord and your lost child? Will you stand in the gap between the Lord and your loved one that you see struggling? Will you stand in the gap between the Lord and our nation? Man, it breaks my heart because it seems that all I hear is complaining about government. And look, I don't agree with anything they're, most, most anything they're doing. But rather than complain about it, let's pray about it. We have to see it as a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual problem. Look, Natalie read me some stats yesterday. 44 of our senators voted to kill a child the day it's born. 40, 44. Each of those represent a large group of people. That's not normal. That's not, we would say that's not humane. It's not human. That's demonic to its core. To its core. To snuff out the plan of God. Look, this isn't my message at all. But it's what we're going to talk about for now. I want, I want to, to cue you in onto something spiritual concerning that. Every time. Biblically, there was a mighty move of God. Every time a deliverer came on the scene, there was an attack against the children. Am I right? There was an attack against... At the birth of Jesus, what did they do? They killed the children. At, at the birth of Moses, what did they do? They killed the children. Before the next mighty move of God, what do you think the devil's going to do? He's going to try to kill that deliverer. He's going to try to kill that messenger in infancy, just like he always has. We have to recognize this, and we have to combat it by voting, but more importantly, by prayer. We have to pray. We've been given spiritual authority. You as a believer... You as a child of God have been given spiritual authority. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age, right? So who's been given authority over them? Who's supposed to do battle? We are. If my people, who's that? Who are called by my name. Who's called by his name? Christians, Christ-like ones. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, then I would hear their voice from heaven and I would do what? Heal their land. Forgive their sin and heal their land. Right? So who's, who's responsible? Who's responsible? Everybody hold your finger up. Now turn it to yourself. I'm responsible. You're responsible. 
We should be doing spiritual warfare. We should be entering spiritual warfare concerning our family, concerning our nation, concerning our state, our area right here, our communities. Because we talked about that the last two weeks. There's demonic strongholds over the area you live in, over your neighborhood, over your city, your community, your state. There's territorial devils. There's strongholds that have been there for a long time. And a lot of you know exactly what they are, right? Take authority. Stand in authority. Be that one who will stand in the gap. Off my soapbox, back onto the message. Walls. Walls are built to limit access, right? To limit access. Limit access both in and out. Because they work both ways. What we place behind the wall of security is what we see as valuable. We build a wall to protect something that we see as valuable, right? Where do you want your kids at night? I want mine home. That's where I want them. They're not always there because they're grown, but it's still where I want them because when they're there, guess what? I know they're safe, right? When they're out of the walls, I know they're safe because the Lord's given me some promises. But I sure feel a lot better when they're in the walls with me. You know what I mean? I don't think that feeling ever goes away, does it? Why? Why do we want them there? Because we see them as valuable. We want to protect them because we see them as valuable. We don't leave our valuables out in the open. Known bank robbers don't get to visit Fort Knox and go on a tour. They're screened out. They don't welcome them there. They have walls there. And they, and they vet who comes in there, right? Known jewel thieves don't get to go in and View the Hope Diamond. Look, even the casinos have this figured out. And they watch, they monitor closely who goes in there. Because there are known card counters and things like people like this who they won't allow in. If the world's figured this out, we as the church have to get this concept. We have to understand that there should be some walls in our life. There should be some borders that we protect. We place strong, secured walls around the things, around the valuable things. And we screen everyone prior to, it, to allowing them entry. Walls are built to keep in what we want and keep out what we don't. The border wall that Tyler put up there, that's not about keeping everyone out. That's not what it's about at all. It's about being able to screen who we let in. It's not about keeping everybody out. That's not what this, this nation's built on. Because if you look around, we've all been imported. Every one of us. All of, if we go back in our generations, we'll find that someone came here from another land. Whether they were, they brought, they were, they traveled here willingly or whether they were brought here against their will. Because in all of our lineages, there's probably some of both. So it's about screening who we allow in. It's not about keeping everybody out. I have walls around my home. But I allow people in all the time. But I don't allow anybody in. Not just anybody. It's not just open to anyone. 
It's open to most. Right? There's been a lot of people fed there. Good food and the word. But it's not just open to everyone. That's why I have a door. And that's why I have a lock on it. I make the determination of who I allow in. And you know what? There's been some I've asked to leave. You understand? Prob- you probably have too. Why? Because the way they act wasn't welcome there. I didn't want what was on them to be deposited in my home. If we see our country as valuable, border security should be the utmost importance. Wouldn't you think? So how many of you agree? Look, you don't have to raise your hand. Yeah, you do. How many of you think that's important, that we secure our border? I think it's of the utmost importance because I want to know who's coming in here. I, I welcome them. Do it the right way. Do it the right way. Then pay your taxes like me. If you didn't put in the pot, don't reach to grab something out of it. You understand? It's amazing that that's controversial. That's so common sense to me. But this will go on YouTube and I'm probably get hate mail. Who, but who cares? I don't care. Because that's just logical to me if we see the anointing of God and this is why I asked you to raise your hand because there was a hook in it if we see the anointing of God and the plan of God for our life is important we'll protect it and we'll secure it at all costs We'll put up secured borders and we'll carefully screen who we allow access into our life. I've got to have a wall around my life. It's not to keep everybody out, but it's to screen who comes in. I'm not trying to be ugly, but I'm not shopping for new friends. I'm not. I have found something. I've got this one. And that's, I'm good with that. I'm not trying to be ugly. Am I trying to say you're not my friend? No. But what I am saying is is if everybody turns their back on me and I got that one, I'm good. Because now I got somebody I can still come into agreement with. I got somebody that I know is for me and not against me. You follow me? So I'm not out there trying to make new friends is what I'm saying. I carefully protect who I become a friend with because they can infect me. You you understand? Now, does that mean I exclude them from my life? No, not necessarily. But I limit my time. Because the more time we're together, the more I'm going to act like them. You got it? Proverbs 25, 28. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. You think God's in favor of walls? Sounds like it. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. He said in Ezekiel, I'm looking for a man to build a wall. Right? Do you have rule over your own spirit? We all want to say yeah. But we have to continuously analyze ourselves and determine truthfully Who or what is directing our steps? Look, this is something we have to do all the time. We have to stay in in constant communication with each other about 
Who am I listening to? Who am I following? Look, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great ministers out there. I, I'm not denying that. But I have to also realize who God's placed in my life. What's the covering God's placed me under? What's the stream of anointing that he's placed me in? And I've got to stay there. You follow what I'm saying? I don't even listen to a lot of preachers. You might think I, I would, but I don't. I listen to a couple because it's the ones God's placed in my life to speak into my life. Does that make sense to you? I'm not knocking any of the others. I'm not. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them. I'm not. But I know where God's placed me. Do you have influences in your life that lead you away from the plan of God for your life and rob you of your anointing? Do you have the, Don't answer me. And especially if they're sitting next to you. Don't point. But do you have influences in your life that pull you away from God's plan for you? I can't answer that for you. You have to survey your life. I have to survey my life and say, is there anyone, Lord, that I've given access to that's really just robbing from me? Hey, it all made sense when we were talking about the country, right? But we have to break it down on an individual level. If they're just taken from my life, why did I let them in? You follow me? Why did I let them in? If they're not pulling me toward God, if they're pulling me away from God, why did I let them in? Hey, what's, what's one of our biggest, uh, and, and I'm talking about as conservatives, which I think most of us are, but what's one of the conservatives' biggest complaint about foreigners coming into our country? They bring their culture with them and they want to worship their gods. Right? Legitimate, legitimate complaint. But what about in our individual life? When we let people in, and now, now they want us to worship their God. It may not be Allah or Buddha or Muhammad, but it may be an activity. You follow me? You follow what I'm saying? We, ha we have to build some walls around our life. Most people, even Christian people, are not spirit led. They're either flesh driven or they're people pushed, but not spirit led. I appreciate the testimonies that we had this morning because it shows the importance of being spirit led. Because if you're not spirit led, you're probably not going to be at the right place at the right time. We call that an, a, a divine appointment. And if you're not spirit-led, you miss a lot of divine appointments. If you, wait for, if you wait for the appointment to make sense, you might miss what God's doing. You better be able to recognize when God's speaking to you so you can move immediately. When he went to the fishermen and said, put down your nets and follow me, what's the scripture say they did? It says immediately they put down their nets and followed him. Immediately. You can flip through your New Testament and you'll see multiple times when Jesus said, let's go, and it'll say immediately. But then you'll see an account, a couple of them, where he said, follow me. And a man said, wait, I, I got to go to a funeral. But tomorrow, Jesus said, never mind. He said, what you should have done was let the dead bury the dead, and you should have just followed me. Then another one, he said, go... You, you want to follow me? Oh, more than anything. He said, then go, go sell all your stuff and give the money to the poor. Whoa, 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 whoa. I got a lot of stuff. It's going to take me some time. Well, then, then never mind. We have to be ready to follow immediately. Because if you don't act immediately, you may miss your opportunity. The opportunity of a lifetime is only good for the lifetime of the opportunity. And then it's gone forever. There's a sermon. Somewhere in here. Most people either flesh driven or people pushed, but they're not spirit led. The Holy Spirit is supposed to be our tour guide through life, leading us into the promises of God, but most are not led by Him. 
but rather by their own flesh. And when I say flesh, I'm talking about their thoughts, their fears, their traditions, their emotions, their familiar and comfortable, which are an enemy of God. Hmm. They're led by, or they're led by other people who are blinded to the things of God. If you were going to go to that place that you always wanted to go to see, to take a tour of, and you got there and you had the opportunity to follow a blind tour guide, is that the one you'd go with? No. Because how's he going to lead you to show you all the sights that he's not even seen? Are you with me? So why do we go through life people, following people who don't see the, into the spirit realm? Why do we follow people who don't even know what the blessing of God looks like? Why do we follow people who we, there's no proof that they can even manifest the supernatural. But we listen to their opinion. You with me on that? Are y'all following me? I want you to get this. Because every one of us in here has done it. What do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? How about you? What's your opinion on what I should do? Have you ever done that? How about ask God? Lord, what is it? I, I was talking to a man just a couple of days ago. And he said, this is what he told me. I'll think about it. I said, bro, you missed it. What do you mean? I said, when you think about it, you become confused. And you weigh the pros and the cons. And the scripture says God's not the author of confusion. I said, promise me something. He said, what's that? I said, that you're not going to think about it. You can pray about it, but don't think about it. Because when you think about it, you mess up. I'm speaking to someone specifically. You can pray about it, but don't think about it. Don't stay up at night laying in your bed trying to figure out how you're going to make it work. You bring it and you lay it at the foot of the cross and you say, here it is, Lord, direct my steps. Your promise is you order my steps. I know who I'm speaking to. It's me. Hope you get something from it. Matthew 15, 14. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall in a ditch. That's pretty obvious, right? Let them alone. Get thou away from them. Build a wall between yourself and them that they will, they will lead you. I'm sorry, they will not lead you into the promise of God. They will lead your life into a ditch. I'm not talking about physically blind. I'm talking about spiritually blind. We can probably all look back over our life and see that, 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 see that, one, that person that we befriended that altered our life in a negative way. We all have them, right? Look, we went somewhere the other night as a family, and I chuckled, and they said, what? I said, I used to be banned from here. Yes. Why? Because of who I went there with. It wasn't what I did. It was what they did. But I was with them. Right in the middle of the ditch. Know what I'm talking about? Hmm. I'm not necessarily saying... Build a wall between you and that person where there's no contact. What I'm saying is build a wall between yourself and them where they have no influence into your life. Okay? You may maintain a certain degree of contact, but make sure it's you speaking into their life and not them speaking into yours. You follow me? But there's sometimes when we just have to shut it down completely. You follow me? There are some times, and look, here's the thing I found about that. When the Lord tells us, shut it down completely and destroy all lines of communication, there comes a time in our future where we are strong enough where we can come back into their life or allow them back into our life a little at a time. You got that? 
But if we don't cut off everything initially, sometimes we're not strong enough spiritually to not be led astray. Okay? So we have to be completely isolated from that influence for a season until we're strong enough. Whoever your soul is joined to will have a great influence in your life. Whoever you connect yourself to will have great influence into your life. So don't connect your life to someone's, someone who you don't want your life to look like theirs. Does that make sense? If I don't want my life to look like yours, guess what? I'm not going to become connected to you. But if I want my life to, if you got something I want, guess what? I want to be around you. You follow me? That makes sense? Look, that makes sense in the natural and in the, in the spiritual. If I'm just, if I'm a, a businessman, I'm going to hang around someone who can su successfully run a business. I don't want to be with the guy who had 10 and they all went under. You, you follow me? I want to be around the one who made it work. He may have had some that went under, but he figured out what he was doing wrong and made it work. You see? Well, how about spiritually? Yeah. I want to be around the one who can manifest what the Word of God says. If you just talk about it, but I don't see no fruit of it, I don't want to be connected to you. See? See what I mean? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Those who we are intimate with, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, will determine the course of our life. Y'all hear me? Young people, y'all hear me? Who we connect ourselves to, physically, who we're intimate with, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, will direct the course of our life. Old people, that goes for us too. Because we're never, we never grow out of that. Second Corinthians 6, 14 and 15. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Who's he talking to? Well, if you're unequally yoked with an unbeliever, you must be a what? Okay, he said believers. Are you a believer? Yes. Then don't be un unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Baal? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? He's saying don't develop an intimate relationship with an unbeliever if you're a believer. That's pretty simple. He said don't get emotionally, physically, or spiritually attached. Because what happens in, in the natural when you yoke two animals together that are... If, look, I trim some mules, bless their heart. But one, they're both huge... But one's a lot bigger and stronger than the other. I, I'm not a mule skinner. I don't know a whole lot about it, but I, I can figure things out pretty good. What happens when they're unequally yoked? What, you think, what do you think that wagon's going to do? It's going to drift toward the stronger one's side because it's pulling harder. Does that make sense? It would be like your car having a, a bad front end alignment or your front end being out of alignment, what's it do? It pulls one way or another. So when you have a team that's hooked together with a yoke and they're not matched, what's going to happen? You're going to drift. If you're drifting one way or another, what are you eventually going to do? You're going to make a cycle. You're going to make a circle. And eventually you're going to come right back to where you started, tasting that vomit one more time. You know what I'm talking about? So when we find ourselves making cycles, one thing we need to question is who we yoke with. 
I'm not talking about your spouse. Look, I didn't, I didn't give you my stamp of approval to leave them. No, not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those people who we make business connections with. I'm talking about we create friendships with. I mean, we create an emotional bond. We may, if we're, if we're single, we may date them. Y'all follow me. And I'm not talking about one date, because one date, you hadn't even figured them out yet. But when you realize this will be unequally yoked, don't continue pursuing that. And we could get deeper than that, but I think you get the picture. Are you led at times by the influence of your own emotions that have been stirred by meditating on a thought that was not derived from the mind of Christ. We have to build a wall around our mind and screen every thought before we allow it to enter. That's probably the hardest thing to do, but it's the most important. I have to take account with my, of my thoughts. I catch myself doing it during worship. I caught myself doing it today, and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Where's this going? Get back over here. You, you're fit. You, you're not. Get out. You ever talk to yourself like that? Yeah. My wife does it out loud. And I'm always asking, what did you say? Oh, I was talking to myself. Anyway, that's, that's a whole other conversation. 2 Corinthians 10.5. Cast down arguments and every high thing. Arguments where? Where's, our, where's that argument he's talking about? That's not talking about with other people. He's talking about your own brain. He said, get, cast down the arguments in your mind. You ever argue with yourself? Yeah. That's where all that confusion comes from. Find out what the word says and go with that. Okay? All right, cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bring every thought, which ones? Every thought in captivity to the obedience of Christ. So when a thought pops into our brain, we have to capture it. And we say, is it fit for meditation or does it need to be cast away from me? Because if it's not fit for meditation and we meditate on it, what's it going to do? It's going to stir up some emotion. And then when the emotion gets stirred, then what do we do? We act. Right? We do something because the emotion was stirred. Or, even worse, we say something. Because now we're speaking, and since we're a speaking spirit with the ability to create what we say, we're creating a word, a world for ourselves that was built from our emotions that were stirred from a bad thought. If it was stirred from a bad thought, it must be a bad emotion, right? And then it created a bad word that created a bad world. And then we're looking around at our world and we're saying, how did I ever get to this place? And it all started with a thought. Now, we could reverse it and say it started with a godly thought that started a, a godly unction or emotion down in me. And it caused me to speak the word. And it framed my world, and I love it, and it's perfect, and it's just like God planned for me. But how many of us can say that? Because we allow our emotions to run wild because we allow our thoughts to run wild. Take captive. Be very careful when you lay in your bed at night because that's when we're most vulnerable to let our minds run. You follow me? Pastor Mike says this. He said the most dangerous place for a Christian to be. This is, if you know my papa, I'm just going to say it how he says it, okay? He said it, not me. I'm just quoting him. He said the most dangerous place for a Christian is not the whole house. It's not the bar room. It's not the casino. The most dangerous place to, for a Christian to be is alone with his own thoughts. Because when, he's a, when we're alone with our own thoughts... We can muster up 
all kind of crazy concoctions in our head. And, and we, can, we can rehearse curses that before, previously never existed. And then all of a sudden in our brain, they're real. I saw, I saw a meme. I can't tell you what it said. But it was a husband and wife laying in bed and they're facing away from each other. And over the wife it said, I bet he's thinking about another woman. And then it showed what the husband was thinking, and I can't share that with you, but it had nothing to do with another woman, you know. It was something, but we get the idea, we, we'll stir up thoughts about what other people are thinking, what, how other people are going to respond, what's going to happen in our future, how's this going to work out, how am I going to pay that, where's this going to come from, how are we going to make that work, and, was, and next thing you know, our emotions are all, we can't sleep now. Now we've got to take medication to help us sleep because we let a thought run away with us. And now we're so stirred up. Now we're, now we're hyperventilating. Hey, I, I, and now we need another pill. <laughs> All on an assumption. All on something that's probably never going to happen. Cast down every thought, every argument, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What are those? Those are ideas. Those are ideas that we had that, that contradict the word. Those are things that we thought were going to happen that don't line up with the truth of the word. And next thing you know, we'll speak it and we'll manifest it. And then we'll say, I knew that was going to happen. That's how it always happens. It's always something. Yeah. Because you always say something. Are you driven more toward what is comfortable than toward God's plan for your life? The more you walk into and through the uncomfortable situations with God, or another person, the more trust you build between the two of you. Don't be so quick to not let God lead you through an uncomfortable situation. Don't balk when God says, go forward. Yeah, it might be uncomfortable. But when you come out on the other side, you go, ooh, it built faith in me. Horse training 101, huh, Miss Stacy? Horse training 101. How do you build a trust between you and the horse? You make him do things that he is uncomfortable with. And when he goes through it, he'll build, it'll build trust in, he, in both of you. You'll trust him and he'll trust you. He don't want to cross that scary tarp, does he? And he'll go around it. And he'll balk and he'll snort and he'll do all kind of things. But when you finally drive him across it, the first time it's going to be really quick or he may jump over it. But eventually, he'll just walk on it, stand on it, because now he trusts you. And the next thing you know, you could bring him into a bigger obstacle, and he'll trust you. It's the same with God. He's going to lead you to something that you're going to feel uncomfortable with, and he's going to expect you to walk into it anyway. And when you come out on the other side, you're both going to have more trust in each other than you did before. Now he can trust you with something greater. Now you can trust him with something bigger. Does that make sense to you? Mark seven thirteen. Making the word of God of no effect through our traditions, which we've been handed down, and many such things we do. We've, we have to build a wall around our mind and screen every thought and measure it against the truth of the word. But it, that doesn't mean that we can't allow for a new idea, a new thought. That doesn't mean, because see, if we block out anything new, we can't grow in a progressive revelation of Jesus. 
We can't continue to grow in the likeness and image of God if we instantly wall out everything that's new. If I stay, why would we wall out things that are new? Because the old is comfortable. Why do I wear these jeans? They're old, but they're comfortable. You all know what I'm talking about? We like the old and comfortable because the new makes us uncomfortable. And we don't like it, so we stick with what we know. But here's the problem with that. If we only stick to what we know, guess what we're going to have? Exactly what we have. So we can't have what we want until we do what we never did. You can't have something you never had without doing something you've never done. Does that make sense to you? So you can't go into a new area. You can't go to a new level in God without progressive revelation. And you can't get that without letting go of something that was old and comfortable. You understand that idea, that concept. We have to build a wall and we have to screen the ideas. We have to screen the thoughts. But when it's from God, we have to grab a hold of it. Even though it may be scary. Even though God may be calling you to start a ministry. And you think, I don't know anything about that. I've been there. I still don't know anything about it. That's why I have to depend on him. And that may be the exact reason he's calling you. Because he wants somebody who don't know anything about it. So he can do it his way. He might be calling you to start a business. And you might say, I don't know anything about that. He, look, it might be as simple as he might be calling you to go share the goodness of God with a neighbor or a friend. And that might scare you. Look, that's one of the most uncomfortable things I do. I can do it up here. I can do it at any church anywhere. But one-on-one, -on -one, man, I'll get choked up. And I'll worry, Lord, what, what am I going to say? I had somebody come to me just this week. I don't even know him. But he came up to me and started sharing with me what he's going through. And honestly, it was stuff I didn't want to hear about. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It was stuff I really didn't even want to know. But then in the middle of that uncomfortable situation, it was uncomfortable because I didn't know what to say. So I said, Lord... I don't know what to tell this man, but apparently you want to tell him something. So what is it you want to share with him? And I preach messages. I hit highlights of messages that I've preached over the last 10 years. Really. And Natalie, I, I was sharing with Natalie, she said, how do you do that? How do you even know he's going to understand what you're talking about? How, how do you know he's going to understand the spiritual side of that? I said, I don't. I just had to tell him what God told me to tell him. The rest of that's between him and God. So we can't, look, that's uncomfortable for me. That's uncomfortable for me. That, therefore, I know I have to push into it more. I don't like going to someone in the store when the Lord tells me, go tell them something specific. I don't like doing that. I like to stay to myself. But when he does it, I've told him no. And I didn't like the way that went. You know, you know what I mean? You ever done it? He told me specifically, go tell this woman a specific message. I didn't know this woman. I'm trying to go in there and buy my box of nails and go home. But he told me, go tell her. And I said, no. And I walked right on by her. And then I got about two aisles down. And he said, really? That's what you're going to say? No, sir. No, sir. Lord, if she's still here, I'll tell her exactly what you wanted me to say. But it's uncomfortable. And I went back, and guess what? She was there, and I shared with her. And she broke down, and she started crying because something silly that I thought was silly that the Lord told me to tell her meant the world to her because it was concerning her daughter that was living on the street. 
I didn't know that. It sounded silly to me. I didn't want to be made uncomfortable. See what I'm saying? We have to be willing to let God take us out of our comfort zone. Build a wall around your thoughts, but not so much that you can't allow the Lord to do something new. What we know, what we're familiar with, what we've always done is where we're comfortable. But it can only get us to where we are right now and what we've always had. We have to build a wall around every area of our lives, around our mind, around our relationships, around our emotions, emotions, around our tendencies to walk toward the comfortable and familiar. The plan of God is at stake. The plan of God for your life, or let me say it this way, is the plan of God for your life valuable to you? Is the plan of God for your life valuable to you? Is the anointing of God on your life valuable to you? Is it valuable? You can answer, is it valuable? What is valuable, you will protect. The more valuable something is to you, the greater the walls of protection you will place around it. The way you protect the plan of God and the promises of God reveals the value that you place on it. Here's the catch, scripturally. What you see as valuable, the Lord will increase. What you see as common or ordinary, He will remove from you. You understand that? Do you, do you get that? You want scripture on it? There's a certain master who was leaving town. He gives, calls three servants to him. He gives them each a sum of money. Then when he comes back to town, he asks for the one who he gave ten talents. And he said, look, Lord, I invested what you gave me, and now I have twenty. Well done, what? My good and faithful servant. The same with the one who he gave five. Then he gets to the one that he gave one. He said, Lord, I knew how you were, so I went and bur buried it. So here's your talent back. He said, you wicked and perverse servant. Now, take the one from him and gave it, give it to the one who has 20. See, isn't that backwards from the way we think religiously? We think, well, that one that has 20 ought to share. That ain't how God saw it. He said, take it from him because he didn't treat it as valuable. Now, give it to the one who does. See? What you treat as valuable, God will increase. What you treat as common or ordinary will be removed from you. Don't treat the plan of God for your life. Don't treat the anointing as common. Protect it. Build a wall around it. Shore it up. Screen who you let in there. Treat it as valuable and watch what God does. It will begin to increase in you. He'll give you more and more and more and more. The more valuable you treat it, he'll, he'll trust you with more. You wouldn't give your kids more of something that you found left in the yard, right? No, if they leave their toy in the yard, you're going to take it from them and say, I'll give it back when you can learn to appreciate it, right? But if they take good care of it, you want to give them something else, something nicer, because they proved they were trustworthy. God's no different. God's no different. He's not going to keep giving you something that you tread on, that you... Uh, you know, you corrupt or despise or let anybody walk on. Amen?